Um, I'm going to talk to you today, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm going to talk to you today about this crazy idea I had a few years ago about using blockchain to help artists solve a puzzle. And I want to be clear from the beginning, I am a skeptic and a believer at the same time. And so what you're going to see here is some contrasting opinions of a few things, so bear with me as we go through. So I've entitled this A Skeptic's Guide to Believing in Blockchain for Music and Media. Um, the current blockchain space is really interesting, and you've got large companies effectively leveraging shared ledger technology, smart contracts, privacy, and trust in various ways, including countries doing some interesting things and some terrifying things. And I'm going to say something that doesn't make me very popular at crypto conferences right now. So the Bitcoin market cap today is at about $130 billion. It's about 10,000 nodes. It's production hardened. It's why I got into it. And Bitcoin is a form of token or a, a, a coin, if you will. And there are lots and lots of other coins and tokens, and they're mostly bullshit. And initial coin or token offerings are the pre-sale of mostly bullshit tokens and coins, which is currently around a $12 billion industry in the last three years. And 54% of all of these offerings have already failed. So it's a very interesting space. Now, the cool part about that, though, is that 1% of these ideas are game-changing, built by incredible teams, they're creating the internet of value, and they're somewhere in all of the above there. So a lot of people, when I started to talk about blockchain, say, had various complaints about them. They're mostly bullshit, they said. Okay, I agree. <laughs> they can't or won't scale, I agree. Adoption is going to be a problem, I agree. But these are all challenges. They are not showstoppers. Nothing is going to put this genie back in the bottle. It's coming, no matter what. Because 1% are game-changing ideas built by incredible teams and are creating the internet of value. So the current ICO market as of this morning you can see is about, uh, just in 2018, there's been $7.73 .73 billion raised. So in the month of May, we're looking at $945 million. And I want you to consider the size of the music industry, which we'll talk about in a second when we go into this next phase. So then when we're talking about blockchain in general, where are we in the cycle of this technology? And the great William Mugair has said this, so selling the vision 2013 to 15, build out 2015 to 16, installation 2016 to 2018, and right now we're about to deploy. We're gonna deploy this technology at scale. So it's a really exciting time as then we go to acceleration and vision. There will probably be a massive crash right in the middle. So it's a question of are we on that precipice now or where do we lie? So, my specialty is obviously the music industry, if such a thing can exist, a specialty in the music industry. And when I looked at this technology, I thought to myself, well, what could possibly go wrong? So a lot of companies in the music space chose to focus on consumption, artists and fans, rights management and others in this sort of shared ledger, smart contract, privacy and trust style technology. Gosh, it's really odd not being able to see everybody. Is that better? Then I can't see what I'm doing, doesn't matter. Oh well. Um, so most of these companies and most of the 99% bullshit are trying to build Spotify, YouTube, crowdfunding, ticketing, or insert some other existing centralized company but on the blockchain. And it's not going to work that way. The power of blockchains is they're not centralized. They're not owned by any one person. There's no gatekeepers. That was the promise of it, right? Whoever Satoshi Nakamoto was, whoever he, she, or they were, didn't intend for there to be a gatekeeper on the way in. That was the point of decentralizing. So this is what we got to watch out for. And there's an acid test, which again, William Mugair published beautifully, and I'm totally taking butt crediting, 
When you look at a company in the music space or media space or any blockchain space, you have to ask these three questions. What would happen without the token, without the coiny bit? Can it still operate? Would, why do you need a blockchain? It's a strange question, but most people want the blockchain to raise money through bullshit ICOs. And then what is the blockchain enabling that wasn't there before? All of these questions are absolutely vital and key if we're going to unlock the true potential. So the reason 99% of it's bullshit is because they're not adhering to those tests. They can't pass them. That's a bummer. But in the same way that as the internet was deploying, you would probably want to own some pets.com, some rubberchicken.com, and maybe some stock by this company from a guy that used to sell books out of his garage called Jeff Bezos. You'd want to own all of those, so you've got to dig for what's in there. The other thing is that there's no one music industry. As the previous panel here was talking about, they're talking about streaming. And there's two music industries in my mind, two kind of key ones. There is the business of making music, so the EDM community has really embraced this side with music production gear now hitting $9.8 billion per year, projected to grow 9% through 2020. That's just in making stuff, right? Just in the gear that's needed to make stuff. And then you have the music business, which with the massive rise in consumption is now down 63% adjusting for inflation. So as YouTube, Spotify, all of these platforms has been deploying at scale, we're down. And the total music biz business this year is 17.4 billion. So again, it's gone on an upswing. But the question is, is it going to be a hockey stick growth or not? But the interesting part is, if you look down at the bottom, middle, 472 million, that's, ironically, money coming from those people buying all the DJ gear unencumbered by labels, not doing it the, tr the traditional way, not being accounted for in that larger ecosystem. And that's where the potential is. So again, the music business, not the business of making music, but the music business, US Stream, 618 billion, up 43% from 2016. 70,000 independent revenue sources per song from Cobalt. Spotify, 25,000 tracks per day around 140 million tracks on SoundCloud, 11 new hours of audio per minute. And then you've got, of course, 5 billion YouTube, the elephant in the room. So the current complaints that musicians and artists have tend to fall into these three things. Evil corporations are the gatekeepers, or unfair payment terms from Spotify, Apple, etc. Artists are getting screwed by all of the above. It's bullshit. It's not true. Artists are not being screwed. This is the greatest time there's ever been to be an artist. You have a means of communication at your fingertips for free that never existed before. Digital music platforms, in general, pay 70% of their revenue to rights holders and creators. That's not a bad deal. That's not terrible for running mass cloud infrastructure, paying out at scale, and running all those hundreds of millions of hours through your service pipes. If you don't want to be there, you don't have to. Most large corporations will give themselves every advantage. They're not there to make everybody happy. And streaming is most importantly a way, but it's not the way. If you're not happy earning $100,000 from 25 million streams, don't go there. Go somewhere else. There are many platforms doing it. Ryan Leslie, who spoke this morning, makes $2 million per album cycle from 15,000 fans using SMS. That is hacking. The last company I founded, Pledge Music, the average fan spends $55 per transaction. EscapeX, another platform, three to $4,000 a month in comments from fans. Comments. So there, again, streaming is a way, but not the way. So we can't just complain about evil gatekeepers and corporations and have the blockchain come in and save everybody. So, my kind of mantra is this, never confuse music being sold badly with people not wanting to pay for it. They can pay for it if they want to. You have to offer them the experience that they're after. So the blockchain opportunity, which is why it was the headline of this, right? There are two sides to every song. 
so traditionally speaking, the song has a writer or writers and a performer or performers. You know, uh, Walking uh, um, So Crazy, performed by Patsy Cline, was written by Willie Nelson. So every time Patsy sings, Willie got to get paid. And that's been a challenge because Beyonce had 70 plus songwriters on her last album and 100 contributors, all of whom have to get paid micro pennies every time one of these services streams. That's why they got to take 30%, <laughs> because they got to go through this mess, deal with the lawsuits and everything else. So this is not an easy thing to just kind of stand up and make work, right? And what has changed from the analog era to the digital era is songs are now files and files go everywhere. You cannot stop the torrent. And it's a house built on sand because every time song files are copied, their data can be altered or removed completely. For example, this is an amazing cover that you should all listen to. It's Mo covering Frank Ocean's Lost. And this is me taking it from YouTube, whacking it into a stream ripper and creating my own version of the file which I then add into iTunes, I add my own artwork to it, and then I retitle the song to read Benji's great song, I retitle the artist to read Benji Rogers, and then I make the album Benji's great album. And now I have created my own copyright, right? So now this sits in Apple's server paying who? But wait, there's less. <laughs> So there is no one place, public or private, to look up or verify ownership of songs. You may have heard of some famous lawsuits recently, 1.3, 1.6 billion dollars against Spotify. It's because we don't know who all of those hundred songwriters in Beyonce's Lemonade are, right? So today's music industry represents about 180 to 5,000 centralized databases with little to no interoperability. It means that if you write down a songwriter here, it's not going to synchronize over there. And stakeholders in the music industry do not share their data, but also they don't use a common file format. The most prevalent file format in the music industry today is called the dot .wav. Have you ever seen it? It's like your song name dot .wav. It's 27 years old. George Bush the first was president when we introduced this brilliant new technology. And then Bill Clinton became president as the MP3 emerged. And we're still using it today. It's like faxes and letters, it's got to go. So, oh, my clicker, there we go. The thing that blockchain to me will solve is that there is no protocol for media. We have a protocol for the internet, so anyone can build a website. We have a protocol for email, so anyone can send an email, SMS, voice over IP. We know what all these protocols do, but there is no specific one for media. And that's where I think the opportunity for blockchain is. So, we can learn something, ironically, from shipping containers. Standard dimensions, subdivided contents, multi-party ownership, and they influence the size of every truck, train, crane, ship, port, plane, bus, you name it. Radically revolutionized shipping. And what was interesting was there was a 780% increase in commerce when they standardized in an ISO format this container. So what if a song were the same thing, or a piece of video? What if you had the publishing or writer's side, and you had the recording side, and you put it into a standardized container format? And then you synchronized audio files, ownership rights, metadata, and licensing info. What you would have created, in effect, is a music industry-owned format or protocol. It would enable tracking, communication, most importantly, and monetization of media files using a blockchain. The blockchain is the synchronizing agent to all of those files. So what that would enable you to do once you've built this protocol, like you have for the websites or like you have for email, is you can give a song a dashboard. So your song can suddenly have requests coming into it, publishing info requests, messages from Spotify, song verification, artist verification. You can have participant parties to the song, like a Slack channel or a WhatsApp channel, so everyone's involved in it. And then most importantly, you can have a version history, a provenance trail, like so the container enables the interface. And then if you want to license or work with a song for your video game or your movie or your uh, whatever, your YouTube channel, 
You can message the participants to the song. You can have a conversation in the song. And then once you've agreed to a split term in this case, you suddenly have the truth written down between multi-parties. It's the first multi-party asset. And then you have to get the data right. This is the hard part, right? Um, so the data side of things, I've lost my monitor here, but that's okay, we'll be fine. Um, so getting, right, getting the data right is key, because who, how do we know who we say is who? So we've been building a huge amount of machine learning underneath it, so that you can sit there and take a limited subset of information on the song, a cover of David Bowie's Suffragette City by James Wind and Fire, right? And you can add all the relevant information and punch it into a blockchain. A global decentralized database of music rights. For classical music, four entries becomes many. So basically what you have is all data can be managed or replicated and synchronized in a decentralized system if you think of it as a common file format or protocol, right? Don't think of it as an application. Think of it as an actual protocol for how it's going to work. And then the cool part about that is, is you're then speaking the same language because each new media file will write itself and any changes permanently to the blockchain. We need this language because we speak media, but we don't have a common vessel in which to write this information into. So then the big question always comes, as it should, who does this hurt? And I've, been, I've spent the majority of my life trying to get artists paid. It's a really hard job. Um, you wouldn't think it is, but it is. And I think that it would hurt those who profit from a lack of transparency, piracy, or the slowing down of payments to rights holders. Is everyone okay with them being hurt by that? Yeah? Okay. So now, the big question, why would they do it? Because for the first time in history, there is more money to be made over the table in an open system than under it. Because every single large platform that is scaling today is doing better than the entirety of the music industry. A small digital streaming service is going to be doing somewhere comparable to the volume of a country's music industry because it's a data game. And so my bet and what we've seen thus far rolling out is just that there are now blockchain teams within most of these larger organizations. So we built a kind of a prototype of this, which you can see here, I think if I hit play, yeah. So basically we took a song, put it in Spotify, right? And the audio fingerprint finds the blockchain address, and now all of a sudden, you can see ownership information within the song itself. Immutable can never be taken out in a decentralized system. We're using what's called the Sawtooth Lake blockchain. I'm showing you this because this is what's going to come. Now we can build all of those interesting Spotify's and YouTube's on top of this, but we cannot build a modern music industry on top of faxes, emails, and phone calls. The data protocol for all digital media is a communication layer between the parties of files. I envision that it's how every piece of media will move around the web. It's how all media creators and owners will securely encode their identities into their digital assets. If you wrote the song, write your name into the damn song. If you remixed it, write your name into the remix. And you can pay everybody through attribution. It's the first modern multi-party blockchain-backed digital media asset. We have to achieve this vision. And the cool thing is it's on this way. Bottom line, in my mind, is this. Creators, rights holders, and influencers who can digitally encode their rights into their media will control their own destinies, and they will lead rather than follow. They will be the ones that punch through these walls. And finally, there is one thing stronger than all the armies in the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. So I think the time has come. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.